titled Predicting Ecosystem Metaphenome from Community Metagenome. So first of all, do, does any of those words, how many folks, if I get the hands, it, it have a clue as to what that means already? Any hands? No, oh, completely. Uh, all right. Uh, sort of. Right. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it, well, it comes from the, um, let's see, the genotype to phenotype a grand challenge of the cell and molecular biologists. So I'm going to be talking about that. But the basic idea is you can go from the, um, the, the sequences of nucleic acids in an environment to the structure and dynamics of the ecosystem. And uh, so that's the basics, but um, let me lead into it. First of all, I think that theoretical ecology has, I'm, I'm, I would say, the critic would say, spinning its wheels for a while. 50 years ago, we did uh, diversity, stability, and complexity. Then we got to get a different version, of what I feel, of the same thing, biodiversity and ecosystem function. Then we went through tipping points. And now we're pretty much, to me, where we began in, with coexistence. Isn't that stability again? And, and weren't all those things sort of stability? Um, so what I'm trying to do is suggest that theoretical ecology focus towards more, I would say, tangible data <laughs> rather than concepts. Let's go for the data. Let's, let's theory needs to predict more rigorously and precisely and generally data. So that's what this metaphenome to metagenome, oh, metaphenome from metagenome is about. And the way they, um, the molecular and cell biologists did focused towards their um, phenotype, from genotype, I should reverse that, uh, from genotype to phenotype, is they set up a grand challenge. And the grand challenge at first was the human genome. And once they got the human genome, uh, they figured out they didn't know enough about how genes led to the phenotype of an organism. So back in about, um, oh, so, so, so I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Um, they had grand challenges to get themselves there. Let me first now start explaining the terms in my title. When I talk about ecosystem metaphenome, it's basically the phenotype of the ecosystem, what they call the metaphenome, um, the phenotype of all the phenotypes. And it's the biological uh, characteristics of an ecosystem we're talking about the species composition, the abundances, and their dynamics. In, in that, to get there, you have to deal with the interactions among organisms and their environment. Basically, you're talking about a whole system understanding. So we're talking about the sum of all the organisms' phenotypes, including their behavior and dynamics. There's a huge issue of how much detail are you talking? We'll get into that, but in, there's many levels of detail, but, um, uh, but we can, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the metaphenol. You could go to the Holdridge life zones that went ahead and predicted just the basic class of ecosystems from the temperature, and the uh, the rainfall the um, of the organ of the environments. So we, it's not as crazy as it sounds. We predict ecosystem metaphenome at least at a basic level, not from the nucleic acid sequences, but from the climate variables. So we've been doing this for a while to some degree of resolution. I'm talking about really upping our game in terms of the level of resolution. And to get there, I want to start with the Comet community metagenome. So we're talking about the sequences and abundances 
uh, of all the nucleic acids in an ecosystem. And that not only includes our DNA, which gives us barcodes, which gives us our species list and a clue into all the literature that describes those organisms, their body size, their diets, um, their environment, their temperature and environmental tolerances. Uh, if, if we get, if we know who's in the ecosystem, we could mine the literature for those basic variables. But the, the um, but the RNA has got an extra level of magic. It will tell us the activity of the DNA, which DNA sequences are actually being, um, being sequenced or transcribed and actively creating proteins and participating in metabolic interactions. So the DNA, it, it's kind of tricky because it can, to flow in from another ecosystem somewhere. If you take a core out of a lake or out of the water or out of a grassland soil, you take the DNA out, you get an information, you get information as to what organisms are there. But the RNA will tell you things like the ontogenetic life stage of the organisms, the um uh let's see the the who's growing, who's not growing, that sort of thing. So there's a huge, I think, revolution going on in our ability to get information from the nucleic acids of the um, uh, uh, in the environment. Now, Darwin's been looking at ecosystem, we've been looking at ecosystems and their species composition and dynamics for centuries. The revolution is we can do it for freaking cheap now. The DNA sequencers are increasing in power and our ability to extract the basic information about the ecosystem is hugely increasing. And so um, we're able to extract multi-level information for, about the organisms. And when multi-level at the kingdom level, the genus species, you can even figure out the individuals, you know, who was that individual's parents? Crazy amounts of detail, more detail than I think, hopefully, than we would need to, to predict the structure and dynamics of the ecosystem. And then depending on where you get those sequences from, if you take an organism and you take the sequences out of all the, what they call the metagenome out of an organism, you can figure out what it eats. You can figure out what its parasites are. You can figure out what its symbionts are. So you can uh, um, you can figure out what pollen load it's uh, it carrying. You can figure out what seeds are in its gut. So you can talk about, you can figure out reproductive services. That's a huge amount of the information that we need to be able to predict the structure and dynamics of the ecosystem. In some ways, we're just observing the structure and dynamics of the ecosystems if we keep on sampling these metagenomes over time. So it provides both the raw material to have theory predict ecosystem structure and function, and it also provides the data to test your models, to test your theory. So this is uh, basically what the cell and molecular biologists set out as a grand challenge back in, if you see it, 2001, where Tomita talked about whole cell simulation, a grand challenge for the 21st century. And if you read in that abstract, the study of the cell will never be complete unless its dynamic behavior is understood. And they talked about a computer model that could put the, um, the, the idea of the genome, the proteome, the transcriptome, and the mat metabolome, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, together to be able to predict the phenotype of an organism from its genotype. And then about a decade later, this was like 2012, they actually achieved that for a human pathogen. I think it's a bacteria. And it's a, it's an if we look at the sophistication of this 
the theory and the model articulating the theory of how the genome of this um, of pathogen determines its phenotype, it, it's, uh, it's pretty incredible. I would say it vastly exceeds that which we ecologists put into predicting the structure and dynamics of our systems. If you look at the climate models and some of the larger uh, physical models, that the magnitude, the rigor of the theory, the amount of effort, the number of people, we start getting towards what the cell biologists do it, have done, but um, we really haven't matched it. And that we're talking about multiple people's efforts across the planet. We're talking about large databases um, we're, uh, and just the concepts and the technologies to do what they did is really remarkable. And what they did was they start with the genotype and um, which is basically the, uh, the DNA sequences of the organism. And if, I wonder, there's only a few there. How many folks even know this whole circle of going from genotype to the transcriptome, proteome, metabolome, and phenotype. Now, are folks sort of familiar or very familiar? But very familiar or sort of? Very, all right, all right. yeah. It's pretty, to me, I think it's a huge triumph of biology. The fact that we know how DNA gets transcribed into RNA that but it instructs ribosomes how to create proteins, oops, proteins, which interact within a metabolome, the metabolic network of an organism that gives rise to the phenotype. That's, I think, first of all, it's just beautiful. It's awesome. And of course, the COVID vaccine, the way we're able to inject RNA into our own bodies that makes proteins, basically the COVID, um, one of the, uh, the um, attachment proteins for which our body creates antibodies and therefore we can travel this summer and things like that. You know, that's the sort of thing that you can get from this deep understanding. That's what they've done. Uh, they, they, they've modeled this process in the, uh, in, uh, to get to predict phenotype from genotype. This gives you a small chunk of that model. <laughs> These, uh, this is a famous metabolic pathway diagram. You'll see it in a bunch of um, cell biologists lab. Here's a little blow up of a tiny piece. This is the fatty acid synthesis and the number of reactions, the number of parameters specifying the, um, the, the reaction coefficients and the cofactors. And if you get into this stuff that they pretty much have modeled, it's what I said surpasses what we've done in ecological modeling. And I, I'm basically asking that we up our game to embrace some of what they've done to achieve what we want to do. So instead of a metabolic pathways and, and transcription and all that stuff, uh, uh, the way I'm looking at it is very similar actually to what they have done. And that is to create the network of interactions in their system and simulate their behavior. So what I'm going to is here on our, the right is a, a diagram of what I want to do, which is modeled after what they did on the left. And I'm not talking about a full mechanistic going from genotype to phenotype. I'm just taking the fact that the genotype identifies the phenotype, more of an informatic task, and using that fact to motivate this circle on the right. This circle on the right being start with the metagenome, the uh, nucleic acid sequences in the ecosystem, use it to identify the species in the system, the organizing systems, organisms in the system, and use the abundance of those sequences to tell us about the abundances of the organisms, reconstruct the network of species interactions and other relationships, including phylogenetic relationships, 
to predict the metaphenome. So we're going around a similar circle. It's, it's different. It's not mechanistically similar. It's conceptually very similar, especially with this orange part of the circle where they have, when they talk about the metabolome, the set of interactions among all the uh, um, chemicals within a cell or within a body, we're talking about, a, a, well, I'm talking about a network. I, 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 well, I wanna make sure I'm gonna talk about a particular approach to this grand challenge, but there are other approaches. You know, Whoever wants to do it any way they want to do it. And I think the nature of these grand challenges, we don't know how, who's, who is gonna succeed and how are they gonna succeed, but I'm saying we need to put it out there to, um, well, I think it's useful for us to put it out there to motivate ecology, especially theoretical ecology, to a more productive advanced state. So we, we both are doing interactions among different species, biochemical species in the metabolome, um, organismal species in the, in the ecosystem con context. And we're doing it in similar ways, but there's fundamental differences, of course. So many of you have seen this. This is pretty much a simulation of, a, um, of an ecosystem based on our allometric trophic network, uh, um, let's see, theory of, of ecosystems where species change abundance over time according to their feeding rates, their metabolic rates, who eats them. We include parasites now. Uh, we've included uh, mutualisms more recently. We've developed a pretty, I would say, sophisticated theory for why ecosystems look and behave the way they do. Um, so um, let's see. So, so there's other ways to do it, and I'll talk about the, there's one way in particular that um, successful meeting of the challenge that I cited by Carr et al. They used a very similar way to the way that we're working on this. My, my lab group, my colleagues and I are working at it, but I'll talk about the other ways, ways they're doing it too. It's pretty fascinating, the variety of approaches. So um, one of the key things that what I'm suggesting does is it really gets rid of this whole fundamental thing about ecology having positive and negative re interactions, that which is in every ecology textbook, even biology textbooks, where you split out effects in this typology of mutualism, predation, competition, that sort of thing. I'm saying, forget those effects. Give me the mechanisms. Give me the, let's start with the, uh, the reactions, the equations. You, you can call it whatever you want, competition, a predation. You could just even give up that stuff. Just give, specify the equations. And here's the equations for our, our allometric trophic network model. We call it a nonlinear bioenergetic ecosystem model, where we just model the rate of the change of the biomass. It, 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 it's equal to the growth rate of the plant if this I species happens to be a plant, minus well, let me go it in pieces. Let me gray out. So, so for just plants, we're, they grow according to, to a growth rate, and then they uh, lose, um, let's see, uh, well, they lose according to what eats them. So that, that and I'll explain these other terms in there. That's a, um, basically, that's a, uh, the amount they're eating, eaten, or that's the amount of loss that the um, that the organism the plant loses if this close growth rate of the plants is basically a, uh, a simple logistic growth rate we have more sophisticated um, nutrient based models of growth but basically there's some growth rate for the plant for the animals they lose according to their metabolic rate 
times their biomass, a straightforward thing. And then there's this AIJ. Here it's the metabolic activity, basically the, the rate of the organism's life times its maximum assimilation rate times the functional response. And now the functional response is where a lot of work is going on. And I'm sure we're only beginning. We have some very basic functional responses. I imagine during this grand challenge, the sophistication of these functional responses will increase dramatically. We've included now, we have things like prey, predator interference or prey defense in these equations. We have, we have some important things and they're able to do a lot. But this is where it starts. These, the work on functional responses will continue. So what I've outlined is something based on Rosenzweig and MacArthur back in 63, modified by Yadzis and Innes in 92 to put it on a bioenergetic basis. We generalized that to N species in 2004. I'm going to talk about our application to Lake Constance of 212, where we've added detritus and maintenance and activity metabolism. Actually, that's a pretty fundamental change that I'll gloss over, but, um, but there's some, I think there's important developments during this whole sequence. We've been started looking at fisheries back in 2016, and most recently, and last year, we published a paper on uh, pollination networks. So this equation is changing. We're adding things. We're, it's going to be building up to be more and more capable of addressing more and more things, things like size structured populations that Andre works on a lot, um, uses some of his work to do that, um, mutualistic interactions. We're, uh, I imagine this sequence will definitely have to continue quite a bit to achieve the challenge. It's based on the metabolic theory of ecology, the fact that we can get the key parameters for these models based on the size of the organism, both the, its metabolic rate and the maximum production rate of these organisms are fairly well predicted. Of course, these are log log graphs and we're all should be healthy, have a healthy skepticism. Those are orders of magnitude variability around those lines. It looks like a good fit, but you know, we know it's not that good of a fit, but it's useful place to start. And that's a huge. So here's the, um, oh, oh, and um, by the way, if you guys, just raise your hand or something. I would love to, you know, answer any questions during this. There's an, there's not that many of us that we don't, we can't have discussion. I would love to hear it. Um, but um, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and talk about a particular application of this theory, and that is to Lake Constance, this beautiful um, uh, lake in Central Europe. Those are the Alps in the back, and um, it's a well-studied lake. In uh, and we could they put together a food web with a bunch of there was white fishes and perches up there, and um, we have ciliates and rotifers, and there's daphnia there. So uh, like about six uh, groups of or five groups of algae plus bacteria, detritivorous bacteria that eat dissolved organic carbon over. 20 years they've been sampling the lake for about um, bi-weekly, sometimes weekly at several points. And this is a time series that we put together based on 20 years of data of your average year going from like January to December. And if you know temperate lakes, you know one of the more fascinating, of course, this green represents a bu bunch of algae increasing during the springtime, but then the Daphnia start increasing in abundance. They, they hammer the um, algae to low abundances, but then this lep leptodora, this big predator comes in and crushes the, the Daphnia in between a low food supply and a very voracious predator. And that makes for this, what they call the, the clear phase the, of the lake where the algae gets very, very low. So here's the list of species. 
the ciliates, the algae, the rotifers, the crustaceans, the lepidora, um, all the, the, the species in the food webs, this is how the, the, their relative abundance changes over time. That was a um, verbal theory about this for a long time. We used our model to make it into a quantitative theory where we included egestion, the, giving rise to dissolved organic or ca uh, carbon and, ac and also exudation from the uh, phytoplankton to that dissolved organic carbon that was key to matching that data that we saw. We put in the initial biomass of the different organisms in the spring, and from their body masses, we predicted if they were a plant, their uh, growth rate, if they're animal, their metabolic rate. And those are the numbers that we basically start, initialized the model with to predict these dynamics. What we did, we you see these dotted lines, we splitted each of these um, what we call phases into one uh, relative abundance data. And uh, uh, so here's the data that we actually predicted. It was a sample of uh, the average of each of those phases. This little five to 10% uh, of bi the biomass is blown up here to the right. So you can see these ciliates and rotifers. That's the empirical data. Here's what the model results were. Basically, we have an 82% similarity between the observed and simulated data. It's pretty darn good, especially when you go to ecosystem uh, biodiversity and ecosystem function, their amount of variance that they explain is usually in the single digits, like 5%. I think they're lucky to have 10% of the data of the function the functional variable that they're observing explained by the biodiversity of the system. So this shows that predicting a detailed ecosystem phenome from at least the network structure is plausible. I think we can get there. I would hope we would start from a, a microcosm in the lab, maybe a mesocosm out into the field, and then finally one of these full ecosystems like Lake Constance. But this gives you an idea of what I think is possible from going from ecosystem, uh, call it metagenome to metaphenome. And we would get the um, network from the nucleic acid sequences in the environment that would give us the structure and it would allow us to mine the body size and type from the literature, provide our in initial conditions and then predict its dynamics, similar to what we did for Lake Constance. But the source of the data wasn't 30 years of intensive observation the way they did it. It's actually just, well, just, it's actually extracting sequences and getting that information with, with what I would say vastly less cost, vastly less time, and much more, uh, a much higher resolution. Uh, so we can, we can put these networks together much more, I would say, easily now. I've outlined this idea in a review that I wrote last year in Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution, where we've gone to, um, uh, we, it's a, basically a consumer resource theory of ecosystems, um, and it talked about it further. Uh, I, I've got a paper in review specifically on this grand challenge at Ecology Letters. Um, but um, I was wondering, I'm hoping now we've got, okay, so I've only been talking for a half an hour. I can talk more about how we added mutualisms to this framework, but I was hoping maybe we can get some questions from folks right now to see what people are thinking. Anyone wanna chime in? Hey, Neil, this is Axel. Hey, hey Axel. Hope you're doing well. I am. Yes, so, so I have a question. I, or let me, let me um, speak a bit longer. Um, 
I think the, the elephant in the room here is the question, how good can we predict these systems, um, uh, the, the, these, these networks or what they do once we have built a model? Right? Yep. We can build a model and then the question is how good will the model be? And, yep. and um, what you showed us was a, was a short term prediction of something which, which the people who observed us have seen happens again and again and again each year. That's the, the reproducible part of the dynamics. Very much but, so. But if you would go at, at species level, probably you would see that, that there is species turnover happening and, and much more complicated dynamics. Yep. And I believe that would not be so easily predicted. Yeah, I, I would say that, of course, the level of resolution. One thing I think we should be able to do is just tell us how much carbon, how much biomass is in the system. That is key for determining the effects of global climate change and uh, the whole carbon balance of the, of the planet. So there's these really crude levels of prediction that are hugely important that I, we could you think we could do. And then there's the very, very fine detail that who, I'm not sure how many people are interested. It's certainly interesting for us as theoreticians to figure out how precise we can get. You know, can we talk about the different uh, strains of bacterial detritivores that are increasing and decreasing? I think, you know, I see this as Let's see how far we can go right now, you know, in both in how far in the future can we predict things and what level of, say, taxonomic resolution we can capture, because you're totally right, Axel, that th there's a lot of details that we probably won't get, uh, well, we'll are much more difficult to get. Uh, we have diseases among the diatoms, you know, the viral outbreaks amongst diatoms. There's you know, there's incredible amounts of detail that I think we can observe that will be difficult to predict. But the whole challenge would be like, all right, who, what, what's the state of our ability at this time? I think what I've outlined is kind of um, one plausible state that we should basically advance, get more resolution, as you said, and see how far we can go. Well, the, the, I've been working in fisheries management for a while, and there are lots of people who try to, for example, model the, the food web of the fish in the North Sea. And using models similar to, to what you just showed us. And they are having extremely hard time making predictions. Yep. I would they say have very nice data, have very nice data. Lots of, of uh, surveys going on, diets are very well known. Yes, predictions are extremely difficult. Yeah, so at the, again, when we start, you have um, uh, Nelson Hairston's lab at Cornell doing the the rotifer and the the or the um, is it a rotifer the uh, zooplankton and the phytoplankton, and that's just two species. And so they have a good understanding of that. I think uh, um, we could we should go we should increase complexity. So fisheries, hopefully we would get there. Um, but right away, I'm not thinking that's where um, this theory, this challenge will immediately show benefits. I think we've got to build up from simpler systems to more complex systems. Mm. But Chris said something. Yeah, Chris? Um, I was, I was going to say really that I think lots of the progress that's come from when the molecular biology world has come because they've had repeatable and um, conserved structures. So you can study E. coli and everyone can agree, let's study E. coli and it tells you stuff about everything else. So, I mean, it might not be exact, but it's close enough that it's pretty useful. Exactly. So I guess really it comes down to what, what could be the ecologist's E. coli that everyone has to some extent agree to focus on something. <laughs> and I think that that's going to be really hard. And even if people were to agree on I don't know, some Drosophila system or something. There's not necessarily that much evidence that what you learn that is those Drosophilas will transfer particularly well. So I, I just wonder, yeah. Yeah, good, excellent point, excellent point. So, um, yeah, I think uh, we have different candidates for model systems. We have, um, 
the, the uh, Nelson Hairston's, uh, uh, what is it, zooplankton and phytoplankton system. We have, um, oh, back at Silwood Park, they had, um, what is it, oh, uh, those microcosms, what, what, um, I'm thinking, I'm forgetting the, the people that worked on those lovely beaker systems. Um, um, what was it? Sharon, Sharon Lawler. And uh, she was one of the authors of them. Um, hey. Yeah. And so, right. so um, you know, we do, you're yeah. right. It would be it great good to um, see. Oh, uh, I think now. someone has a microphone that needs to be muted. Um, cool. um, let's see. So yes, we have to agree on some model systems. And that's, I think there's some good candidates out there. Uh, the question is, who's going to rise to it? And so that's they, to be determined, right? <laughs> uh, um, uh, the, and just like the molecular biologists, they start with E. coli. They haven't really done, I think they're getting towards a eukaryote in terms of genotype to phenotype. That's like their, their newest challenge or I, I'm not, they might have met it. So yeah, start simple, build up, generate agreement. Those are all very necessary tasks in this endeavor. I totally agree. Okay. So, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, have you finished? Well, I think there's Matthew and Andre. Yeah. 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 Okay. Hey, Matthew. I've really enjoyed that talk. Um, now, quite early on, you had a picture of the kind of cellular level stuff from genotype to phenotype, and the, then the ecosystem level stuff from metagenome to metaphenome. And you said that those are in some way similar to each other. Now, maybe you didn't mean all that much by similar, but I was wondering if you could say whether what you mean is more than just that they can both be represented by um, graphs of interactions and by differential equations. Is there any kind of deeper structural similarity? Um, let's see. I think, okay, uh, structural similarity. I would say the deep similarities include networks of networks. I think that conceptual core of both endeavors is key. The idea that um, uh, from those nucleic acid sequences, we can observe, describe, and simulate the networks of interactions that create the physical characteristics of the entities we're studying, of the living entities we study. I think the, uh, so the, I would say the orange, the green and the red parts of this, these both sides are very similar. Um, uh, let's see, even mathematically, we have Michaelis Menten, uh, 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 what we call functional responses they call, um, let's see, chemical dynamics. Uh, so the networks of interactions are key. Now, this whole transcription to a proteome, I think with the proteome, and again, the yellow parts of these have quite a bit of similar a similarity. That is, what's the identity of the participants in these networks? That is, I think, basically similar. Uh, you you got to figure that stuff out. I think the biggest difference is this whole transcriptome. We don't have that going on at all here. Um, well, we might in terms of, I can imagine a hybrid approach where you have, do I, the question, are there, uh, say, nitrogen fixing bacteria in this grassland? And you see the rhizobium RNA being highly expressed. So, the, the, in, in this, in the, in my side of the, this diagram. And so you are getting information about the inner, the network from the RNA within the ecosystem. So 
those are the similarities. I think the, uh, uh, the probably perhaps more importantly, well, these similarities lead to other similarities. The structured collaborations that were necessary for the molecular biologists to achieve what they did, what kind of meetings they had, what kind of databases they generated, what kind of problems they ran into in coding this thing up. Those, I think, um, are quite similar. Of course, there's huge differences, but I think their experiences are, are very helpful to our endeavor. So that, how's that sound? Those are, the, those are the similarities that I think are very useful. What do you think, Matt? I think that I don't know the answer, which is why I wanted to find out what you thought. Um, I, I guess I feel that um, it's hard for ecologists to think that biology is anything other, well, hard for theoretical ecologists to think of biology as anything other than differential equations. Um, I, I was wondering if there's, if there's deeper stuff that we're missing, but I don't know what it is. Well, one of the things, the other uh, big effort, um, a lot of these cell and molecular biologists are, they're starting to model every single molecule inside a cell. The physical, you know, the cell membranes, they have millions of water molecules individually, you know, Brownian motion inside the cell. Uh, we we, that's a plausible way where we have individual based models for each of the organisms in our ecosystem, I think more likely is a hybrid system where you have, um, let's see, differential equations for the microbes, but you can have you know, the, the vertebrates would get an individual based model. And, you know, there's different ways this could play out. Um, uh, so if you, again, you look at what the molecular and cell biologists are doing, you're like, wow this is what's possible. Perhaps we ecologists can dream a bit bigger and try a bit harder to achieve what we want to achieve. No guarantees, but I think it's a kind of a cool thing. And Andre, I think, had something. Yeah, <clears throat> of course, you can expect me. Uh, okay. my, my remark, <laughs> Neo. I mean, yeah. I tend to disagree with this and for, the, for a very, very important reason. I mean, you showed the fatty acid cycle, but a, a, pyruvate, a pyruvate molecule remains a pyruvate molecule, remains a pyruvate molecule, remains a pyruvate molecule. It does not change. Your, your balls in that network, if you interpret them as individuals, individuals change over their over their life and they do very different things during their life and so you know yeah i keep saying this i think that uh development of individuals is a fundamental difference between any type of chemical or physical system and an ecological system and we can of course sweep it under the carpet but uh i'm i'm afraid we might be missing then something well, I would say certainly we are missing a lot, right? Um, let's see. Uh, 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 and the question is, how much damage does that do? How, I mean, so we're going to be limited, right, by just what you said. Those are limitations. They're real. They're true. No arguing. The question is, uh, but how much can we get achieved? despite those truths. And I think there's, we can achieve a lot more than we've achieved so far. So I would say at some level, your point makes certain things impossible. Maybe, I, I, I'm impossible, you know, I'm, I, you know, I, I don't do I don't, that. Well, but. okay, that's a, that's a <laughs> it metal. Certainly, it, it certainly make it freaking hard, okay? And so I, I understand that. Um, but I think we can do a lot more. And I don't think that makes what I'm suggesting stupid. You know, I think it's still, we could achieve a lot, maybe even uh, start contributing more to fisheries management if we travel down this path that I'm suggesting. 
no guarantees again, but I don't think what you mentioned means this stuff can't achieve quite a bit. Uh, yeah, that, that's of course to be seen. I mean, it's like, uh, um, it, and it also um, uh, depends on what's the aim actually of your modeling efforts, right? Um, are you aware of the, of the whole development in the EU that uh, they are want to create a digital twins? Digital what? Digital twins. Keep part, on going. No, part I never... of, so part of the Green Deal is actually that there is this program that uh, the EU wants to create digital twins. And one of this, one, uh, for, 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 for both ecological systems, uh, uh, sociological systems, where they can just play out a manage, management strategies and evaluate the outcomes. Uh, so there is an, uh, uh, for example, free, uh, freshwater systems, uh, there is a proposal that that should be a digital twin based on the ecosim ecopath type of framework, which is, in a sense, something similar to what you are doing. So, it's at various levels. This this is an, 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 an uh, a train that is that's uh, that that is driving ahead and that's going ahead. So, you might want to look up uh, uh, this. At the same time, you might also want to then check with the alternative uh, approach the the. The, the brain uh, endeavor that started 10 years ago when they wanted to describe the brain dy uh, dynamics based on, on the elementary uh, uh, interactions, which okay. was less of a success. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I love that brain initiative because what they found out was the topology matters. The network of interactions among neurons was key and that was really hard for them to do. Um, I, to me, I found that endeavor quite productive in that sense. That they, um, that they, they. I mean, where you fail is where we learn. And so, um, and so of course, we're going to fail many times. I think we're advances. I, that's great. I did not know about the digital twins uh, uh, thing. I, I know these ideas are out there in many different forms. I'm trying to sort of articulate it in hopefully a useful way that people can uh, um, uh, can uh, that can uh, motivate this process forward. What I think about is in terms of a, a, a sustainability simulator. Can we put these models together and explore different pathways? I've worked on Polynesian islands, nice contained places where we do have humans and we have economic mechanisms and stuff like that with that we've, um, uh, let's see, included in these models. So, um, what I'm talking about, of course, is a very strict ecology where we could, uh, and I, I think evolution, where we can start on model systems in the lab to really see how far we can get. Maybe if we get beyond, you know, well, I would just love to see if we can get six species in a beaker and get, be able to predict the dynamics say a week or two in the future that would be pretty freaking cool uh, and now to get up to you know a freshwater lake that would be a next level i think we need to understand how far our theory can take us and this is an exploration of that uh, i think uh, uh, that uh, uh, the limitation here is uh, how much we understand the uh, interactions. So, uh, uh, so what uh, Axel asked whether is uh, the same thing uh, with the lake uh, uh, constants uh, can be done uh, at the species limit, uh, uh, level, and it's probably it is not because we don't really know what the uh, uh, the species are uh, uh, interact how the species interact uh, with each other. And what is the underlying reasons of uh, having this uh, species? And of course, if we don't know that, why? What is the different uh, adaptations of the different species? Of course, we don't have uh, anything to model. 
and if we uh, try to uh, replace or uh, not understanding of the details with some big theories, it will not work. Uh, so I, in principle, I, I very much uh, like your uh, attitude and like much, much better than when uh, people try to uh, test uh, huge but very big hypotheses and uh, getting nothing uh, for the case and so on and so on. And, uh, uh, but it's, uh, of course, we have to uh, uh, do the detailed work on the species level if we are interested in, and uh, start with the microcosmos, you are right. And uh, of course, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, appro approach, the genetics was used, as far as I, uh, I understand, just to detect uh, the known organize in the lake. Yeah, yes? well, I would... I would add that the, the, our ability now to get the interactions, those nucleic acids, um, environmental DNA, just gives us, I mean, to analyze diet contents, to figure out the parasites of the organisms. Okay. The, our ability to figure out exactly what you're pointing out, to, okay. to describe the network, is just so incredibly advanced now. I'm saying let's grab a hold of these technologies and do that work. It's exactly the challenge. Can we put together that network uh, for the system? I think yes, in very important ways. How can you figure out who eats who? Oh, you. Um, oh, it's pretty neat. Okay, so there's a bunch of neat uh, uh, technologies. So if you take, say you grind up an organism, do the um, metagenome, what you can do is you select for the large sections of DNA, the ones that you usually want, the long reads, and get rid of them because the digested stuff is going to be mostly short reads. Okay. And you, you could choose the short reads, and that gives you a higher probability of detecting diet items rather than the actual organism okay. or its parasites or its symbionts. And the, these techniques, they keep on, if you keep looking to this literature, you're like, oh my God, they're figuring out so much. And it's, and this is just in the last five years. I think in the next five years, it's just, it's going to explode in terms of what we can, the information we can get out of those sequences. Okay, very much. Nice. It's very good. But of course, you have to do this uh, uh, by species and species separately. Um, it, yeah, you well, so yes, a, um, you do, um, yeah, you can't exactly. There's a bunch of different automated ways where we've grabbed thousands of organisms in an insect trap, and we can get that kind of information out of those types of samples. So, yes, and even population level differences of the species in this ecosystem. Between and the ecosystem, the species in another ecosystem, we can get at. I'm I'm pretty skeptical that your dreams, in this sense, will come true. So so we also had some success story of of making short term predictions using the food web model, where we modeled the the size structure of a of an entire marine ecosystem and its response to fisheries, and all oh, that went very well. And then we look if we look at the same model. It is a species resolved model. It's a, it's a um, PDMM. Uh, if you look at the same model and look, can you predict what's happened at species level? You can show mathematically, no, it's not possible. The, the model is too sensitive to parameters. You just can't do it. And, and so, so I think, I, I like your idea, like, okay, can we, can we say more than just, here is the, here's a forest and there is a desert. We must be better than that. And and there is some certain level of resolution that we can reach, but the species level is probably not. You know, I would say that, and that is the frontier that we need to explore, explore like how far we can get. And, um, and I suspect that this frontier will continue to advance. We're at some stage now, and in the future, we're gonna get, uh, we're gonna get further. Now, you, uh, what you're suggesting is you're gonna hit a wall, dude. <laughs> like you are yeah, gonna like, boom. Like, yeah, and, like, and like no one's going to get, but but that's the hypothesis, and like, cool, let's 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 check it out. If we discover oh. a wall that 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 you describe, 
that's important information that theoreticians should be aware of. And how are we going to discover that wall unless we smack up against it? Well, we did. I think that the reason that the fisheries managers in the North Sea can't do their work is, is this wall that which they're hitting. Oh, cool. Well, I would love to, um, if, if there's a, pay, uh, is it, uh, it, forward me the reference, because I'd like to see that. Yeah, it's, it's that, that book I wrote. Okay. Okay. okay there, if you look at it, that, that's explained. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, it is a very interesting debate. I uh, tend to assume that if uh, 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 the model is so sensitive in species level, then you probably don't really understand uh, the feedback mechanism which uh, stabilize the very existence of the species. So uh, uh, and it's uh, often very difficult to know uh, why that specific uh, uh, species exists. So uh, it's uh, looking forward, of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's levels of aggregation, uh, lumping that we might have to do below which we just can't really figure out, you know, especially I think strains of bacteria, you know, it's like, yeah. are we going to, you know, figure out, like, uh, you know, it, it, there's a lot of clear challenges that meeting them to us now feel totally impossible, bizarre to even conceive of. But I don't think we've really serious, I, 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 what bothers me is we haven't really seriously gone to systematically push up against those fr frontiers. And the grand challenge I'm describing is trying to get us to like, all right, Let's see how far our theory can take us. Let's see what Axel says and Andre says. And yes, those are limitations. Like, you know, are they hard limitations? Are they a little bit so 